Hey y'all, it's JJ. So there's been a lot happening in our respective professional hustles this week. Good things, we promise. Uh, so we decided to throw it back like Missy and post the full-length version of our interview from last season with Marcus Carey and Damon Lawrence, co-founders of Homage Hospitality. Uh, Homage creates hotel experiences based on the African diaspora and was recently featured on the cover of Hospitality Design Magazine's uh, People Issue. So they're clearly continuing to make waves after our chat uh, a couple months ago at the Nomad Hotel in Manhattan. Also, just a quick reminder, please subscribe, rate, review, and share your business. And if you think we're doing a good job, support us on Patreon too at patreon.com forward slash your business pod. See you soon. Okay, so today we have Damon Lawrence and Marcus Carey, who are the co-founders of Homage Hospitality, which are boutique hotels inspired by culture. Um, they traveled here and they're heading right back out. So we're happy to have them here today. Thank you guys. No, oh, thank you. What's up, y'all? Thank <laughs> Thanks for having us. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So number one, we're recording in a dope hotel. So it's a perfect setting <laughs> to have the two hotel connoisseurs talk to us about what goes into that business and then also how you guys have made it your own so i think that's where we'll kick off shana would be more perfect if we were doing this in our own hotel I know. Someone else is right. <laughs> brooklyn song. needs it yes. yeah but i have to show some love to our friends at nomad hotel in new york for for providing space for us to to have a conversation it's awesome. you know it's an important hotel yeah. on our journey we'll have you guys back and then we'll be in one of yours perfect yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. perfect yeah that'd be dope well, why don't we start by y'all just telling us what Homage is and how you got started. Yeah, Homage is a, a hotel company that pays homage to African-American culture through the lens of hospitality. Um, and we, we feel like as cities are changing, as gentrification is, is you know ravaging the cities that we call home, we have a real opportunity to create almost a time capsule, a cultural time capsule uh, within hotel spaces to let people know what culture existed and how can we, um, you know, move forward in the future. Yeah, we make room for a specific consumer. We make room for a consumer that we think has been largely ignored in travel. We don't think that there are any travel brands that speak directly to African-Americans. So we want to do that and, and, and let them know that they're welcome in our spaces. And then, of course, we, we open our spaces to everybody and invite them to enjoy the beauty of black culture. Uh, so that's sort of the line that we walk. And I always like to hear, like, what was your first step, right? Like, you have a building now. You have a, the more that's in New Orleans. But, like, before all of that happened, what was the day one where you were like, you know what I'm going to do? <laughs> like, wait, how does that start? Oh, I can tell you my day one. When I'm, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I was working at, at the DuPont Hotel in D.C., and it was the first inauguration. Um, and it was just lit. Like, the lobby was crazy. Every... You know. By the way, I love that first inauguration. I mean, of Obama is yeah. what you mean. But like, Shana, but just, but just like President <laughs> in Bruh, general. Shana, Shana, I was going to cut him I off and tell you that he every time he tells a story, he That's says it. the first inauguration. Right. There was no yeah. president was, before or after. You already know. I, know. <laughs> you already I mean, know. Like, obviously, we, we know already what you're talking know. About, but this this I is the language that we speak. Yeah, yeah. I don't ever say it. Because it's like, duh. Who else would I be talking about? What other inauguration matter? None of them matter until that one. Right. Uncle Barry, Auntie Michelle. I never cared about none of them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Didn't care about no inauguration. Yes. Well, go ahead. So yeah, the first inauguration, and we had a it was a who's who of celebrities in the lobby, and the owner uh, Jason Pomeranz, he was just the coolest dude. You couldn't tell him anything. He owned the space. He had all these people from Leonardo DiCaprio to Tobey Maguire to Seal and Heidi Klum, and Diddy is there, and all these people are in the lobby, and he knows all of them. Right. And he's just running the show. And I'm like, dang, this is dope. Culture's all here. But the dude who's running the show doesn't look like me. And he doesn't look like who's occupying this room. Mm -hmm. And that, at that moment, I said, oh, I want to do this. Like, I need to be where he's at. You were at the front desk. I was at the front desk. I, I was at the front that. desk. And I, I worked 24 hours that day. I came in early in the morning because of the train situation. I couldn't leave until the next morning. It was a crazy day. Uh, but it was one of the most impactful days uh, of my career. Yeah. Look, you know, for me, I'll, I'll tell my story in two parts. You know, one is 
when the seed got planted, seed got planted when I'm roughly 11 or 12 years old, a, a cousin, um, shout out to Justin, uh, a cousin has a birthday party. And back then, you know, we're in Detroit, uh, you know, one good birthday party idea is just to get a hotel room and invite your friends over, watch movies all night, have a sleepover. So that's what, that's what he did. And, and I go with, uh, you know, my, my father takes me to, to the hotel and I walk into this Hyatt Regency that is it's just massive. It's 770 rooms. I've since learned what it is. Like at the time I had no idea what right. the room count it was. was. Just yeah, it was just huge. But yeah. 770 rooms, it's got a monorail that connects it to the mall. It's across the street from Ford's global headquarters. So that's sort of the idea behind this hotel. And I walked into the lobby as a young, as a young kid and was just like, yo, what this thing here in Dearborn, Michigan doesn't exist in Detroit, Michigan. Why haven't I seen one of these closer to where I am? Mm. That's where the seed got planted, and and then it's just sort of this winding road to meeting meeting Damon when I did and, and coming on board. But I'll tell you that I made the decision to bet my life on this when he sent me the first his first ever sort of concept deck. After we started to work together, we realized we had to put together different materials, and he wanted to go and sit by himself and get something done as a creative and then deliver it to me. And I, I will never in my life forget the moment when I opened the email that he sent me to say, Marcus, let me know you got any comments. I opened it. I opened the document and I just knew he knew what he was doing. You know, it it, just, it was beautiful and it just translated very well with the vision that we had been talking about. Was it just translated on paper in a great way ever since he keeps wowing me with with materials. So uh, that's when I knew like, OK, yeah, I can. At the time, I was kind of talking to recruiters. He doesn't know this, but I, <laughs> I was thinking about it, where I get the next check from. And, and at that point, it was like, no, I'm, 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 I'm on this journey forever. So I'm really interested in. Uh, the different kind of entrepreneurship that goes into running a hotel business, right? Because you're not developing an app, like you're not, you know, renting out an office, you know, <laughs> to like staff the office with cubicles. Like you actually had to, you know, find property, invest in the property, remodel the property, think about zoning and, um, and neighborhoods and contracts and leases and <laughs> say it again for the people in the back, JJ. <laughs> so how how is this type of entrepreneurship different from what you expected, and like how are you handling it? Yeah, hotels are just a really uh, archaic business model, you know, <laughs> especially compared to all the tech business models that that exist today, uh, the new age. And it's very labor, I mean, labor intensive and capital intensive, right? So the conversations that we need to have, we can't go out and raise a million dollars and then go sit in the office at our computers and, and make magic happen. Um, we actually have to find find properties, source them, get these things built, developed. So we have to put on developer hats. We got to put on, you know. I don't know. Designer hats. Yeah, designer hats. We gotta be, we have to wear multiple hats at the same time. So it's it's different. It's unique. But we also are in a lane by ourselves too. So that's exciting as well. Yeah. You know, we, we started the journey in Oakland, California. So we're just surrounded by the type of entrepreneurs that you, that you're talking about, those that can go out and raise a million dollars and reach five hundred thousand people, like serve five hundred thousand people as customers. They can do that off a million and you know, you give us a million. I don't know whether or not that's enough to even get the building open. Like we got it. I have to have enough to give to the seller of the building. So, um, yeah, the capital intensive nature of it is tough, but I couldn't think of a better place for us to start the journey. The meetings that we could take and the kind of people we can get in touch with, um, because, you know, look, tech entrepreneur or, or brick and mortar entrepreneur, we all sort of operate in a very similar sort of mindset. And uh, and the people in Silicon Valley just tend to understand that in a way that, you know, it's tough to get people to understand in other regions of the country. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And I know. So you guys went to Howard. Right. But you didn't know each other there. You met at a day party. Dang, you didn't get research. Oh, wait. She yeah. <laughs> oh, I, have, she I have some facts. I have some facts. Um, so I would like to hear about this. Oh, and I also read that you used to, like, pitch your uber and lyft riders so like i feel like th that's like a gorilla style of networking that we don't hear much yeah, right we're all yeah. on social media hashtagging and yeah. so like i would love for you to talk a little bit about kind of the necessity of that and how that's led you to where you guys are today both with each other and then with the company shannon can i just point out that it's so ridiculous 
for us as Uber drivers and Lyft drivers when we did that. Uh, people would get in the car and they would say, yeah, what do you do? Is this the only thing you do? And for me to respond that I'm open in a hotel, yeah. they never, it, it very rarely did they extend credibility to me right. on, on that kind of statement. Um, sometimes they did. Those were great, great, get great riders. But a lot of times it was just tough to be in that position and make statements like that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we're, I'm, I mean, we're blessed to be here today, but that was, that was a tough time when, when I was going through that. damon has got good stories about some of the people that got in his car though. Yeah, because I made it a point. Yeah, I made it a point to talk to everybody. I didn't, and I didn't care if they believed me or not, because I believed myself. So I would, when they would get in, they would ask that same question. I was very candid about, look, this is what I'm gonna do, and here's my card. I kept my cards in the eyeglass uh, holder in the car, mm -hmm. and then would hand them out to everybody that was interested. Stay um, ready. Yeah, and I think the most fruitful of all those uh, interactions was the. Uh, the head of marketing for Lyft actually got in my Lyft, right? And she didn't, I didn't know that she was oh, wow. the head of marketing. You know, she didn't know really my story, but it was, it tipped me off because she looked in the app. You know, it's, it's a few things that you put in the app as a driver about yourself, right? And she was actually reading it. And I was like, why are you reading that stuff? You know what I'm saying? Like, You're like, just don't where, nobody where read that. Where, exactly, where exactly. am I exactly. taking you? And she was like reading it like, oh, you from Pasadena? I'm like, how do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I volunteered the information. <laughs> <laughs> how do you know that? Like, okay. And so uh, we had a really good conversation. I told her about what I was doing. And she said, you know what? You should meet the co-founder of Lyft. I think he went to Cornell. He loves hospitality. He treats the business like a hospitality business. You guys should meet. And she was serious. I, was, I didn't pay her any attention. I gave her my card. I didn't think I was going to see her again. Like, whatever. But she followed through. And then probably a month and a half Ooh. later, we're in Lyft offices That's talking nuts. to yeah, talking to the co-founder of Lyft about wow. our, our effort. And he's we're still connected to him. Um, so, yeah, just using you know the platform that we have at the time, which is our cars, uh, and using that to our, our, our advantage. I mean, that's just the entrepreneurial way. You know? Right. Yeah, it was and it, it, it's a little bit of a divine intervention, right? Like here I am, a former finance guy trying to help this guy open a hotel and to make ends meet. You know, I'm, you know, sort of pulling my hair out after a few months full time entrepreneurship trying to make ends meet. And Damon says, hey, you know, you know, you could like rent a car and drive for Uber. And, you know, I was kind of anti the idea at first. And then ultimately I gave in and I did it for six months. And that was like a divine way for me with no hospitality background to mm, to, to get familiar. Industry. Yeah, I had to get very familiar with hospitality in a way that I didn't expect uh, I would need to. And and so that was huge. I mean, now if you come to San Francisco and you're looking for a place to eat or a place to hang out, like I know all the spots because I drove all around that city right. and dropped people off at places. Right. Um, so that's all hospitality. Yeah, you were like picking it up along the way. Along the way. You, you learn things about cities driving that you would never learn otherwise. Because mm -hmm. there's certain places in the city you'll never go. You right. have no reason to. Right. Yeah. So it was dope. We learned a lot. Yeah. So uh, can you describe the more for us? Um, so if I'm a, if I'm a uh, traveler, I'm coming to visit New Orleans. Like what, what do I, uh, what can I expect from my stay? Like, and how often will people say, Hey, baby, because <laughs> that's like a necessity. That's right. 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 <laughs> you know, what's interesting about New Orleans is for it to be such a black city. There aren't too many spaces specifically for black people. Um, and hospitality runs that city. And so black people really run that city. What makes New Orleans what is what it is, is the black culture that, you know, reverberates through, um, you know, all the spaces, right? All the spaces are ran and operated by us, but not owned by us. And we wanted a space that was owned by, by our people that paid homage to just what we represent as a whole. And for us, as it being with it being our first property, we had to have a big splash, right? And it couldn't even be that niche to to only pay homage to New Orleans. We needed to say like, nah, this is we are for us. And so the more represents that pays homage to North African culture and the Moorish people, and we utilize the the facade of the building, which is it's like a, has a Spanish stucco Mediterranean feel, and we just incorporated that into the actual design of the space. Um, so it feels it feels very cohesive when you walk in the door, but then like all those 
you know, New Orleans style buildings. It has like the the ornate wood carved um, stairwell that goes up, and uh, it just has those unique New Orleans style features that you love and appreciate. Uh, Louis Armstrong. Uh, his music is going to welcome you into your room. You know, the amenities that we use were very intentional about Shea Moisture being in the room. And you're so not... every you, room yeah, Shea Moisture so you're not ashy. I, love, <laughs> I read in your the Vibe article about you guys, like, talking about that... Oh, no, it was somewhere else. I literally... I've been stalking you for two days, but somewhere else where you talked about the lotion in the rooms. And I'm like, thank you. The lotion in hotel rooms is water in a in a basket and so it's yeah, like awesome yeah. to have somebody paying attention to those little things because that matters yeah 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 you know we think uh so much of new orleans is like trying to push consumers towards energy and drinking and bourbon and like that whole thing so the more just is the complete opposite of that we you know our guests are encouraged to relax and you know, think about the place that they stay as as a as a representation of their own homes, and you know, still go out and have fun and enjoy New Orleans. But when you're here, you know, you get to completely reset. Um, and you know, that kind of design just comes from thinking about us, thinking about our people, thinking about Black creatives, especially, and the types of spaces that help them be the best version of themselves. And what what was important before we even launched, you know, so we launched in July, and in that April, I came to New York. And we interviewed black creatives, right? We interviewed, um, I think, I guess Joshua Kissy is probably the most notable person on that list. But we interviewed them to find out what kind of things would you like in your room? What's what's the most important thing for you to to continue to be creative in your space? And what were some of the some of the feedback that you got? Everyone said about the same thing. It was music was very important, mm-hmm. right? So how do you incorporate music? How does that you know? Um, like kind of travel through the space. Is it, you know, Bluetooth speakers in every single room? I need music everywhere I go. Cause when I get in my creative zone, I'm turning on my playlist and that's how I get down. So that was important. And then just the functionality of the rooms, uh, where things are placed. Uh, I don't want to give too many of secrets, but where things are placed and how, uh, what books, like are there books in the, in the coffee table or on the coffee table? Are there books in the nightstand? Are they going to encourage me to think more creatively? And so we were very intentional about sourcing these books, um, how we play the music, what music is played in, when you when you enter into the room. All those things are important for the brand and will be those things that or um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think what's the best word. They, they will be the the key fabrics of our brand moving forward. Yeah. So I mentioned this a little bit before, but I I find that you guys um, like market homage um, in a very interesting way. Like Marcus, the first time I met you was at TechCrunch, right? Right, right. <laughs> uh, right. Which is like a place, a conference for like tech startups. Um, and a lot of the press that you get, I feel, is around like the startup culture and a kind of this rate, this wave of like Airbnb and like home sharing and things like that. So like, have you? Was that like an intentional decision to kind of market your company in this way as opposed to like, you know, going to travel and leisure or like doing like the the traditional hotel type of press? Yeah, I I think I think things like that happen. You know, we're just a beneficiary of of where we are, what we're in close proximity to and what relationships we have. Um, And so some of those stories got written up based on based on relationships and and they've been helpful. you know, travel and leisure and Condé Nast, those things that it, it just happens. Right. I mean, you know, uh, the, the journalists associated with with uh, with those sort of platforms want to tell stories about properties and about experiences. And um, and our peers are showing up in a big way for us and starting to tell our story now that we ha- actually have something for them to talk about. But for a couple of years, we didn't have, you know, a, a space for people to talk about. We just had an idea. And in the middle of that idea stage, it was nice that we still were able to generate press and get people talking. And, you know, all that credibility helps in a, in a, in a real way, in a real way. All right. Now I want to get to the real stuff. Oh, we I love that. Real <laughs> <laughs> now it's time. You can like unbutton those top buttons. We're with your buds now. Um, so obviously this is not a very black space, right? Hospitality in general. Like you said, like we travel and we stay in hotels, but as far as ownership, that is not where we are. So I wanted to hear about some of the things that you've come across trying to present this idea to probably 
not all black rooms, right? Yeah. It, doing something that is centered around and not even, I feel like sometimes when we talk about African culture, it's one thing, but when you put the African American on it, it takes it to a whole different idea, right? Especially in America. And so I know y'all got stories. Yeah, I, I got one specific one in my head. I got, you know, we were sitting at dinner with an investor, a guy that ultimately, uh, you know, crossed the finish line, wrote a check. Uh, so we we like we like him. Right. Uh, but but you know, <laughs> who was he? <laughs> <laughs> but but look, but, but prior to him writing the check, you know, he was trying to get comfortable trying to. Who was he? <laughs> <laughs> you know, JJ will journalize you. I don't even know who. I can't even remember who. Well, once you get, once I tell the story, you go there. Uh, so. So yeah, but you know, before he wrote the check, he was trying to get comfortable, and we were talking through what the more would look like and how we would program it and and des- design it. And he looked at Damon and I at dinner and asked us whether or not there would be chains on the wall. Ah! Or, yeah, 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 yeah. Why? Because that's our history. Oh. That's the, slaves. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you took the money, but like. Oh so, yeah, we had to educate him, so we took yeah. that. We took that opportunity right there to just make it very clear that this wasn't about playing up slavery. Look how damn is looking. Oh, now yeah, I, I forgot about that. He owed us a check for reparations. You know what I'm saying? Like Which we had to get it. Like if white guilt makes you sign yeah. it, do it. Like do but, it. Oh, that's such a that. that's been such a challenge on this journey you know yeah. it's just like when we got to talk to capital you know we got to talk to people that don't look like us right and we're talking about something that is for you know for by us you know right and it and for me i was able to i was able to uh rationalize that make myself comfortable with that get through that and i had to like i had to pull my co-founder along i had to make him more and more comfortable with the idea that we got to talk to people from somewhere else right and, I hear, he's I shaking hear his head you. right now so you know it's it's been a, it's been a journey yeah I didn't have a problem with talking to, you know, talking to people outside the culture. It was just like, he, that was ridiculous. Yeah, 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 was, yeah that, was. that was just low key ridiculous. But, um, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's a, it's a double edged sword. We, we stand out when we go to some of these conferences, right? Cause we're the only ones in the room. So people, everyone knows us now. Uh, but then at the same time in, in talking to capital, I have to be honest to say that it's actually been more difficult talking to people that look like us mm-hmm. than it has been to people that don't. They mm-hmm. actually kind of get it a little bit more. It's actually an easier conversation. I could get to a no quicker. Why right? Do you think, why do you think that is? Why? Um, I think that that's just the the gentrification of culture, just in general, right? Like mm-hmm. they get it. Right, that stretches back to colonialism. Yeah, there's a, there's there's trauma in that. that you know. That's, oh, and there's intention in yeah, it. There's intention in the that. The fact that we think only one of us can rise up. That was the system of that was taught so young, so early. So it's like, of course, there the people that look like us might see you and say, well, if they get the money, I can't get the money. I'm so glad you said that. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you said that because I I get DMs all the time like, man, you're living my dream. You know, I've always wanted to do. Right. Da, da, da. I'm like, well, we you can. Yeah, yeah. like ahead. actually, like there's a lot of real estate in the world. Let's open yeah. up some hotels. What's right. up? And, and actually, actually, if you do it first, you might help me out. You right. know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it's yeah, hard like, being a pioneer. It. It's, right. it's exactly so. Yeah, there's room. There's so much room to do so much more. And I would like to see these rooms that are filled with a whole bunch of white folks and a whole lot of white men start to be filled with us. Do your investors worry that white people won't feel included? Yes, they had that was a serious thing. A is, it bl- is, is it black only, right? That was the thing. <laughs> That's such a bizarre concern for people. I really don't even understand where it comes from. Like, are you not smart enough to understand that if we let the space be inspired by black culture, that that's just a thing? Like, it just it just is a thing. It's still space. Like, what you know? But that's, it really that's frustrates the privilege. Because think about if as black people we only bought things that were marketed towards us, we would never eat. We would never live, drive, do nothing. Because nothing is marketed towards right. us unless you're watching Soul Train and the McDonald's commercials <laughs> right. at in and the, you know, and the, Esco- yeah, Sunday. exactly. <laughs> African American consumers are spending 70 billion annually on travel. Mm. That's air, that's hotel, that's everything. They're spending 70 billion. They spend a third of that on hotel. Not one travel brand is talking to them. One. Have you guys heard of the gathering spot of in Atlanta? Of course, yeah. Ryan's a good friend of ours. Yeah. Yep. So I I interviewed him recently, and he was telling me about how it frustrates him that people describe the gathering spot as like, you know, they ask him, "Well, am I am I welcome because no. I'm white?" 
No. That's not what he said. If you got to ask, if you got to ask. Just show up. You show up to literally everything else. But his point was similar. It's like, why do you automatically assume because I'm creating a black space that white people are not welcome when we have to patronize like your spaces that are purely white spaces? But that's so. the difference between black power and white power. It's like white power is does mean don't come in here. Yeah. Whereas yeah. black power never meant that. Right. So, that's what he said. He said, right. that's not what I'm creating here. Now, right. if you want to come in here and celebrate the culture, then sure, come on, mm-hmm. you know. But it sounds very similar to yeah. I mean, y'all celebrate the culture anywhere else. And it's so yeah, like oh, man, Irish so pubs so and like else. you know, there's all these other types of businesses across many different uh, industries that pay homage to a certain culture, and it doesn't stop me from listening to the mariachi band as I'm getting my burrito. <laughs> Not the mariachi yes. band. Yes. I'm serious. Right. right. And right. it doesn't stop any of them from doing yoga. That's what I'm just like. <laughs> so we, we've been able to figure out in certain ways what we can take and what we can like and so who told us the luau story some did well, we i did what's right? the luau i story? did tell us i said that what's this can you just give the people some man game? i had this i had this young lady who i will not name <laughs> mentioned she said to me like don't you feel like you're alienating other people and the day that she said that she was throwing a luau party <laughs> for her daughter. And they're not Hawaiian, okay? Duh. Wow. Hijacking the culture. And I'm like, yeah, but you're having a luau party. Right. You, that's not the same? No, not really. Because I'm like, all right, we can't even talk. I can't <laughs> talk to you. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Like, why? Yeah. But yeah. we get that all the time. And the only way we can we can deflect that is to create dope spaces. That's the only thing we can do. Right. We create them, program them very well, market them very well. People will show up. They will be, if you ask me, and I'm obviously biased, they'll be the coolest <laughs> properties in every city that we ever go to. Mm. You pick your favorite city, pick your favorite property, we'll be cooler. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? You heard Fact. that. Can you Fact. can you say can you say how many guests you have like per year or you know what what your uh your foot track was like in the more? Yeah, at the more we it's only a four unit, so it's kind of skewed. When we when we launched, we booked up the whole second half of the year within the first three days. Wow! wow. And so when did you launch? Uh, July first. So right before Essence Fest, uh, it was perfect timing for us. We did not plan that, but it worked out. Um, and then after J- January first, we then put our rooms up on Airbnb, and um, we're doing really well too, still. Uh, I just think right now we're probably running about 70% occupancy. I think what's tough for us is the midweek. The weekends are always mm-hmm. super busy. Like, don't ask me for a room on the weekends. But middle of the week Because oh, I was tough. about to ask you for <laughs> <laughs> I just came back from NOLA. So. Yeah. yeah, when we first launched, we first opened up, it was all direct business. People were coming to our website. They read some article about us. And they, you know, it, our guests were 95 plus percent black between July and December 2018. And then, like Damon said, January, we, we put it on Airbnb. Under the thesis that, you know, we want a certain consumer to look at our properties and our rooms and say, that's for me. And we want everybody else to look at it and say, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And we just want to walk that line. And so January 2019, we put it on Airbnb. And now we're probably looking at maybe 40% African-American and 60% all other. And people are enjoying, you know, they think it's beautiful. And we got a boy with a goat. Um, where do you know what a goat? Yeah, we, <laughs> right. I was like, do you know what country do I hear or um, goat? It's the Omo tribe. Omo, Omo tribe. tribe. Uh, oh man, I gotta look it up. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, you know, one of the more popular photos of our spaces. Uh, there's a there's an image hanging on the wall, very large image of a of a young black boy holding a goat, uh, from the Omo tribe, like Damon just said, and and uh, and yeah, we have white people standing in that room, and they are totally fine. Ethiopia. Yeah, they are totally fine. Right. So, yeah, that, you know that's what we want to execute on at a large at a large level. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, I I'm also curious about um your Oakland property called the town, right? So, <laughs> Damon's dancing. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so um, you mentioned earlier that you started in Oakland, right? Uh, so how did you end up opening the more before the town? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're in Oakland and we're talking to people about the concept and we're raising money for this building in downtown Oakland. And we finally find this, you know, a guy that wants to buy the whole thing and he wants to partner with us on it. 
Um, and so we agree to do it. He's going to fund the whole thing. It's a white guy. He's a billionaire. He's got a bunch of money. He buys it. Who is it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lou Wolf. Yeah, yeah. so the guy's Lou Wolf. That, he used to own the, own the A's. I'm going to just go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The guy's there is, is Lou Wolf, uh, former owner of Oakland A's. And so we, we pitched him, partnered with him, um, and signed a deal to basically be the team that, you know, programs and designs it and, and brands it while he funds it. Um, and then the building that we expected to do, it got tied up in, you know, regulation stuff and city stuff. It just got tied up and we couldn't get going as quickly as we wanted to. So a lot of the people that we were talking to about capital before we met Lou, we went back to those people and said, hey, we no longer need your money for that building because Lou bought it. How about you give some of that money to us and let us stand ourselves up, feed ourselves, buy groceries for ourselves? And, and some of those people agree. So raise a little bit of seed money. And around the time that we raise it, his mother is like on a going down a rabbit hole on Zillow, like looking at affordable markets like New Orleans and whether or not there was there was good property options to, mm-hmm. to make purchases. And she finds a building for like four hundred thousand dollars. And, you know, we, we bought it and then we made it the more. Um, wow. and, and so uh, that's sort of how that's sort of how it came together. It's affordable market. It's a tourism market. And, you know, it wasn't quite by design, but we launched our company. And maybe the blackest city in the country, you know, like historically speaking, the blackest city in the country. That's where we launched. Um, there are real important differences in terms of how slaves were treated between like the French uh, who, you know, owned Louisiana prior to the, the purchase, uh, how the French treated their slaves versus how the 13 colonies treated their slaves. There are real differences. So when you when you look at New Orleans and you see black freedom like I do, there's a reason why black freedom is so strong. In, in Louisiana, and it's got a lot to do with how the French treated their slaves. Um, so, and we learned that since since opening down there. So, um, yeah, but Oakland is Oakland is coming. You know, Oakland. We we've since sort of stepped away from the Lou Wolf deal, and we found a different property. And you know, that we joint is lit. it's lit next it's summer. Crazy. Next summer, Lake so Lake so Mary. Summer twenty twenty. Summer twenty twenty. Homage Oakland, Lake Mary. Yeah. So y'all y'all say homage. Yeah, we say yeah, yeah we say homage like homage. Okay. <laughs> More homage. Right, we were just talking about in the elevator. I was like, I say homage. Is that weird? As long as you know how to, to type it right, that's, that's yeah, all that we matters. Just, we just want you to spell it the same. Mm-hmm. We don't. We don't care how you know. It all, it all mean the same thing. So, I I was curious about Oakland because I also know we all know about like what's happening in San Francisco and the Bay Area. Oh, it's happening in Oakland, too. The housing crisis, right? Yeah, it's happening in Oakland. So I was wondering if, like, that had any effect on your decisions there as well. Any effect on that? That was at the... I mean, that was the central issue related to the prior deal with Lil' Wolf. It was a... It's it's a housing-related issue, and the prior use of that building was to take some of the folks that were on the streets off the streets. So that's what sort of made that deal and that, that building difficult for us to do. Um... But the one that we just got, um, just got under contract, it just, that, that issue doesn't exist. So, um, you know, we want to be a part of the solution to that issue. Uh, we have a lot of, we spend a lot of time having conversations with people about the homelessness crisis. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you know, it's just, it's just such a tough, it's such a tough issue. Right. Dame. I mean, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Especially for us as entrepreneurs of color in this space, it feels like we have to do something. It feels like we have to figure it out because when you when you look around it and see who's homeless, it's it's people that look like us, mm-hmm. you know. So um, we've we've grappled with how do we how do we figure out a way to challenge to yeah to to tackle that challenge. It's, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. So partnership is tough. I understand. I love this one, but it is like, I feel like working on something with someone that you also have a friendship with comes with its own things. You don't have to shake your head that hard. (laughs) Um, And so how do you guys manage your working relationships? And what advice do you have for other duos who like have an idea, have a spark and want to go into it together? Anytime I get the question, I always say it's energy first. I don't care about skill sets or anything else. If you think about getting a co-founder, think about working with other people, think about the energy that the other person has and whether, you know, if it matches. And I don't really know how to describe that. I'm sure, you know, people might hear that and not really know what it means, but it just, you can just kind of feel it. And, you know, me and this guy have been running together for three years and ample times on the journey. If I'm feeling low, he's pulling me up. Mm. He's feeling low. He's feeling low. I'm pulling him up. Um, that's a, that's an energy thing. 
And so when we're in the middle of our disagreements, of which we've had many, we remember that like, nah, we, you know, we got each other's back in the more in the most important way which is our mental health and you know um you know our our ability to feel safe and our ability to feel like we're on the right path we got each other's back in that context so some little business disagreement like we'll get through it um but yeah yeah we got a lot we got a lot we've learned a lot about each other in partnership in three years yeah and when you're working when there's two talented people and your talents don't clash um it's really about working on the trust right so working to trust each other and then I, I know early on in our uh, relationship, it was like we both felt like we had to cross over into the other person's lane because it was like, I don't really trust you got the whole thing figured out, <laughs> so let me cross over. <laughs> and then you just learn to stay in your lane. Like, dang, I need to stay in my lane. And Marcus stays in his lane. And every once in a while, we co- we collaborate on things that we feel like we, we need to collaborate on. How would but, you describe your lanes? Uh, I'm more creative in operations. Um, yeah, I'm more like capital and strategy and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And those are two very different ways of thinking, right? Mm-hmm. And just being able to trust somebody else on the journey to have the other person to just say like, oh, yeah, you got that? Cool. I don't, <laughs> I don't have to even waste no brain energy on that. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Here's what mom had to do for me. Shout out to Kim. <clears throat> mom, When I was growing up, mom had to like consistently remind me that the way that I thought about something was not necessarily right. It was just like my way and other people had different ways. And I struggled with the concept of that. I thought that I thought things through and, you know, I had this sort of strategy brain for a long time. So I, I thought that, no, like, well, the way you're thinking about it is stupid and the way I'm thinking about it is right. And, man, it's the co-founder relationship that really, and marriage is probably akin to that. Mm-hmm. Um where you really, you really sort of notice that somebody else's way of thinking about something and a way to approach something is just their way, and you guys disagree, and, and you got to get through that. Um, and so, yeah, we, I mean, there are just, there's so many stories. I, I want to pull one out, but there's, there's a lot of stories for us about the co founder dynamic and, uh, and learning to, learning to trust one another um, that we've had to, we've had to go through. So I read, uh, in, I don't know, one of the many articles I was reading about you, about the time that you guys were both driving and you pulled over and said a prayer. And so I would love to hear, you know, we're both believers. I would love to hear about this balance of like faith and finance, right? Because it's like, yes, you believe, but then also like the bills are due. So (laughs) kind of like, where did you guys find that middle ground? And how is that definitely pushed through? Yeah, Damon's a devout Jehovah's Witness. Um, and I don't think, I don't think I had like close relationship with witnesses prior to, prior to Damon. So, you know, I learned a lot about, um, you know, just be, being accepting and open to, to, to his way of life and, and, and his form of belief, um, learned a ton about that. And so with him being devout and by devout, I mean, early on, there were business meetings or things that we needed to do. And he would push back and say, no, I need to go, um, to the kingdom hall or, uh, I, study. yeah, I need to go Bible study. I, I, I mean, it's bone chilling stuff to, to, you know, to, you know, be in a room, with my co-founder late at night and we're, we're sleeping somewhere. Who knows? We might be traveling to DC for meetings and we're sleeping in the same hotel room. And then he takes a phone call at 1130 PM and it's a prisoner uh, calling him to go over Bible study. Wow. And he, you know, and it's, it, I'm, I'm not talking once a month. I'm talking every night, you mm. know? And so it's that type of stuff that, Let's me know it's okay to say, hey, Damon, uh, let's hold hands real quick and pray because, you know, we got a big meeting coming up. Let's just pray about it real quick. Mm. Um, it was those, it, those cues let me know that it was cool to, cool to do that. Yeah, he's, Even yeah. though you don't necessarily practice the exact same belief. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And then also when, when God is first, then everything else is like, this is just gravy. Right. This is, we just having fun. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Just have fun. Do what you said you were going to do. I, st- I said I was going to build a hotel brand, do it, but just have fun in the process. You know? What's what's your ultimate goal for homage? Homage, <laughs> homage, homage. All of them. All of them. Where, where, where's it going? How, how do you see it evolving like over the next five to ten years? Yeah, yeah. We got big ambitions, big ambitions. Um, Every dope city that you can think of, we got a hotel in that joint. Mm-hmm. And we got some long-term residences too, right? I mean, there's a there's a theory out there that uh, the continent will, you know, is already and will continue to be more and more ready for, um, you know, sort of condo purchases from, from African-Americans that 
decide to head over to the continent once a year, stay for a month, get back in touch, and then or we head might back. all need to be there soon. I mean, yeah. Wakanda, we going back. Right? I'm, getting, I'm yeah. getting ready right, right. now. When, when Wakanda about. happens, can like we get a condo? You know what's dope is we started in Oakland. And we going to end up in Wakanda. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're the movie started at Oakland. <laughs> For all y'all that didn't catch that. Right. Uh, so, that yeah. That is our path. Yeah, you know, long-term residences that maybe we design and, and program. And, and, uh, and you know, if, if the owner decides to head back to the States for... 11 of 12 months those 11 months we help to make sure that there are guests in their uh, experience in the space we could totally see that and then i mean ob- the obvious things are travel goods and home goods and you know west end sells beds to people um so you know there's some real opportunities once people love your space to just make sure they can take parts of it with them home yeah, there's, um, there's tons of tentacles that the homage brand has um just available to expand our reach beyond just physical space um, and into actual goods and products and services that are important as well. And if you walk into a United Airlines bathroom and you see cow shed uh, soap or lotion in the United in the airplane bathroom, that's a Soho House toiletry brand. Mm. It's called cow shed. So that's kind of called what? Cow shed. shed. Cow that shed. Is, that that is, that is, I, didn't I didn't hear that either. But then I was wa- looking at his mouth and I was like, Oh no, that. Was- oh, he said cow shed. Oh, he said shed. He said cow shit. He said cow shit. Yeah. Yeah, he said cow shed. I was like, What kind of branding they doing over there? Oh, that's, that's the way. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I'm about to, I'm about to put, this, put on this cow shit. <laughs> All right, I think we have to let you guys go soon, although this has been so fun. Um, We always like to ask our entrepreneurs for like either one piece of advice that you wish you would have had, one thing you've picked up along the way. Like for the person that's listening that has been sitting on an idea, what do you have for them? Mm. You can take some time to think. Uh... Uh, two things, but they're intertwined. Uh, uh, patience is is super key on the journey. Uh, you're going to be taking meetings and talking to people about your vision, and people are going to be excited about what you're doing. And uh, whatever your ask is of the of the of that meeting or of that person, the time between when you make the ask and when they make a decision on the ask could be there could be time there, and so. You, you one you want to fill the funnel with more of those uh so that you're not quite putting all your eggs in one basket but then two you have got to step away from the work and go build patience and focus on other parts of your life your body is still a thing get in the gym i i can't tell Ooh. you how many times i've burned two hours of time <laughs> uh, i burned a couple watch, hours no, i'm just you seem watch your like, mouth okay I, it's just such a it's just such a good thing on an entrepreneur journey to go burn two hours on a wednesday afternoon when literally nothing is going on in your email no like they're not two repli- hours we see you Marcus. they're not replying you know what i'm saying <laughs> I was about to say, he do look like, a little more buff right? since the last we time see you, I, that, I appreciate hours. you saying that and i really appreciate it's not a video podcast because i think you're lying so, <laughs> we'll uh, take some pictures and, oh okay All right. you know this this second piece i i got it i got to get out there because it was so impactful for me uh, Deshaun Amira, CEO of Maven, gave it to me. It's uh, this stuff happens in waves. You will be in an ocean. You have left the shore. You decided to leave the shore and go swim in an ocean, and you don't know if there's land on the other side. And uh, you know you're gonna be swimming and swimming and kind of doing whatever you can to, to find shore, and then a wave will come. And you know, not a wave against you towards the shore as it typically do- comes, but just think about the wave pushing you forward in the direction that you want to go in that's typically like an email from somebody you've been waiting on an email from uh an intro somebody saying yes to an investment uh you know it just you name it right some article gets published accept those waves as proof that they're sure over there Mm -hmm. accept the wave live in the wave and believe that another wave was coming because the last one came and in between time you know try not to pedal so much and, and struggle so much okay, in the water Marcus. you know just just and I, I i'm regurgitating from deshaun but that it's real this is a wave business entrepreneurship is a wave business and so just appreciate the waves when they come and i love that idea i'm a visual person that idea of like sometimes you just have to wade right like sometimes it's like all the doggy paddling all of that is actually like pulling you under sometimes you just have to like Bob. Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah. I like that. Tech entrepreneurs really need that because again, they can raise a million and go reach five hundred thousand people off that. Like, 
you know, they think they're supposed to be in front of their monitor all, all the time. And to some respects, they are supposed to be in, their, in front of their monitor all the time. Well, I can say in the brick and mortar business, you know, I'm going to send the guy a letter of interest that I want to buy his property and he might take two weeks to get back to me. Mm-hmm. So in the meantime. Go to send it letters, like physical letters? No, you know, <laughs> JJ. <Jesus. laughs> you said it back soon? He did say a letter. He did say a letter, but I think he, the email, he's speaking metaphorically. I know, but Real estate is an archaic business. Know, I'm maybe. sorry, JJ. <laughs> it's an archaic business. We, but Because we have had guests on here who've talked about like oh, standing true. out by doing things like that. By, like, like taking their resume to... And but office. did y'all know that stamps are 52 cents? I, wow. That's why you gotta buy a forever crazy. stamp. You know what I'm saying? That's why you gotta get a forever that's stamp. Wow. What's a forever stamp? The, whatever the cost of the stamp is, it'll be good for forever. forever. So you pay a little extra on the front end, but it's like. You need to invest wow. in forever stamps you really today. really do. Because yeah. they're gonna be a dollar one day. You own a piece of the company? <laughs> <laughs> I don't send letters to them. I still send them to my aunties and stuff. They like mail. What? Uh, oh, it's, it's my turn. Yes. There's, there's We're two. Just over here, yeah, there's two things. Number one, the best meetings are sometimes not the ones who write the check, right? So the people that are sitting there vibing with you, like, oh yeah, 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 those aren't the check writers. Mm. It's the ones that challenge you and leave you thinking, like, dang, did I, did it go right? You know, have you feeling insecure? Those are the people that really vetted you and asked you the hard questions to get to understand if they feel comfortable enough to write the check. That was, that was important for us to learn because we would sit pe- with people and be vibing with them like, oh, yeah, they get it. And then they just like go cold. I'm like, hey, I thought we was, I thought it was lit. I thought we was on to something, you know? And it just didn't work out like that. Like that. And I think the second thing is you're going to get so many no's before you get a yes, mm. you know? And you just have to be, you know, resilient enough to keep knocking on those doors, even though people are going to tell you no to your face via email or however, but then the yeses make it worth it. Yeah. Right. I mean, resilient enough and confident enough, right? Like you, your resilience is one thing. Your resilience makes sure you shows up, you show up to the next meeting, but do you, what kind of, what kind of vibe are you talking with in the meeting? You got to keep your confidence up because everybody's sniffing for confidence. Yeah. And we've had to learn that. I mean, I've had, we've had times where I'm like, man, it just, I don't know, the momentum ain't there. Like, ah, Especially in this industry. Like, come on. Because like, you, yeah. you're competing with, like, people who've been in the game for, like, decades. Yeah, they get, and, they, and generational money. Mm-hmm. The seed money in the hotel business comes from, like, dad and granddad. Mm-hmm. Like, that's who people go to when they White get idea. White dad and granddad. White dad and granddad. Mm-hmm. You know, suffice it to say, I cannot go to Pops about this. Like, it just, <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Kevin, but I can't go to him. So, um, so yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, guys. This yeah, has been really great. This has been good. Where can people... I mean, we'll put all your links in the show notes and stuff, but um, you guys have an Instagram, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, stay homage. So, uh, like, pay homage. Stay homage at stay homage. Uh, we're on the internet. Stay homage dot com. Uh, and and my personal is just m dot a dot carry. Uh, to, like Mariah Carey, you know. So if you want to follow my person, I'm not against. Yeah. I'm not against the idea. People follow me personally. You know what I mean? I think it's a good idea. Uh, yeah, my personal, so everybody knows, is hospitality. You know what I'm saying? H a u s hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you all so much. Peace. Appreciate you. Thank you.